So as we uh, shift into uh, Lent this year, and thinking in ways in which we'll connect with this season, we're going to focus a little bit on um, different aspects of the promises that we make in our baptism. Um, and for uh, those of us, I'm, I'm Lutheran, and so as part of the Lutheran tradition, um, we're often baptized as babies, and we don't make the promises for ourselves, they're made on, on behalf of us. But then we come back during confirmation and we confirm these promises. These promises are, there are many different aspects to it, um, but the main, uh, the main pieces we're going to talk about throughout Lent. And one of those pieces is called um, living with God's faithful people. So recognizing that we don't do this alone, that we're not part of Christianity alone or individually, um, but that we're part of community, for better or for worse. So I want to um, bring in a story that connects with this from Mark's Gospel. This is the beginning of what we call the Passion narrative, right? So the beginning of, of the last days of Jesus, the last hours of Jesus. Let's pay attention to the ways in which community... Um, ways in which community functions in this story. It was two days before the Passover and the festival of unleavened bread. And the chief priests and the scribes were looking for a way to arrest Jesus by stealth and kill him. Because they said, we can't do it during the festival or there will be a riot among the people. And while Jesus was at Bethany, in the house of Simon the leper, a woman came with an alabaster jar full of rich ointment. Nard. And she broke open the jar and poured all of the ointment on Jesus' head. Now, there were those there who said to each other, why was this ointment wasted in such a way? This, this ointment could have been sold for more than, more than a half year's wages and the money given to the poor. And they shamed her. Jesus said, why are you bothering her? She's, she's done a, a good thing for me. You'll always have the poor with you. And you can show them kindness whenever you want to, but you won't always have me. She, she has anointed me for my burial. I tell you the truth, wherever the good news is proclaimed in the entire world, what she has done will be told in remembrance of her. So I want to talk about the different aspects of community in this story and what it means to live among God's faithful people. What does that mean for us? So I think there's a lot of different aspects of what the community is a part of in this story, right? So Jesus is always surrounded by community. He does all of his work really within community. Even when he goes out to pray by himself, he always returns to community, right? So this community here, and what often happens is we see in these stories, they're grumbling, right? They say to each other, um, that this money could have been, or that this, this ointment could have been sold, money given to the poor. Jesus says something that's often misconstrued, right? He says that the poor you'll always have with you. Um, this piece has often been used as, as, a, as a way to shame uh, poor people, to say, well, the poor are always there, we can't really do much about it. Um, when, in, 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 in actuality, if you look at it in context, Jesus is more likely saying, if you're going to be a part of my ministry, if you're going to be following me, if you're going to be doing what I do, you're going to be among the poor and the disenfranchised, those in the margins, right? 
So if you're about my work, you're about that work. Mm. So that's why you're always going to be around the poor people. You're always going to be around the poor. But that community functions in that way for Jesus, right? He, he's at the house of Simon the leper. And then there's this piece, too, and we'll look at this throughout the biblical narrative of what it means for the religious authorities to be looking for a way to arrest Jesus, but they're afraid of the crowd. They're afraid of the people. They're afraid of the community that's following him, right? Jesus was executed not just for what he said, but because he had a following. He had people who were following him. He was stirring up the people, right? Um, I'm working on this uh, video uh, series with, um, I sat down with some theologians in Washington, D.C. Um, over the, and over the course of like an hour and a half, they talked about different aspects that they call Jesus um, and our communities. So recognizing how Jesus is a part of our communities. And so for us to live among God's faithful people means for us to be working within communities. And here's just one of those um, one of those episodes. So this is a conversation that happened in Washington, D.C. Uh, a few months ago. So basically the way the story is told is that it's as a consequence of the, the temple tantrum um, that Jesus throws that, that he is summarily and false accusations are brought against him. I mean, he's even accused of, you know, perverting the people, stuff like that, to pay taxes. So there's all this sort of stuff around that. And he kind of goes into a downward spiral of violence, right? The empiricist, but that's the way the passion here is told. He's executed, crucified, crucifixion being a form of state terrorism. The reason Jesus is executed is not just because he's disturbed, but because he got a follow. And that, that part doesn't get emphasized enough. He's got people following him. To Jerusalem and in Jerusalem, right? So he's he's executed as an enemy of the Roman world. The crucifixion is something the empire does. Mm -hmm. That God isn't, this is not God's doing. And I think we have a lot of interpretations that want to write God to the crucifixion part that you, you know that God's responsible for the death. And that is, I, I don't find that anyone in the text and that doesn't make sense to me. I think it's important to see the resurrection as God's response, political response to the crucifixion. In other words, crucifixion is what empires do. God, what God does, what God has always done is bring life out of death. And Paul talks about this. But from a Roman perspective, Jesus is executed in the name of Roman justice. Right? But unjustly. Right? So it, the point is that the resurrection is about justice also. It is about God's justice. Um, and it, it is about the hope of justice. So I want us to talk about the connection between resurrection, hope, and justice. And how, how, how the resurrection is not just as the hope of an afterlife, but the hope of, 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 of a restoration of life in our context. For me, it's um, the hope that the struggle, that the fight against the struggle is, is not going away. Even if you look at just like the storyline, if you will, of African Americans in our country, the end is not that we will continue to be um, oppressed. I mean, you have Oscar Romero, who we talked about, like, well, if they assassinate me, like, I will come back um, with, through the solid of people. Um, and this sort of thinking about resurrection as, um, like, death not having the final say. The resurrection is about the continuation of the movement. That the, that, that the Romans are trying to move out of this popular movement. And, and they put an end to it. As far as I'm concerned, it's done. But then it's done, it and yeah. it continues. For me, part of the power of resurrection is that Jesus' body comes back in his body. All the ways that that turns us towards the bodies that are used, that are broken, um, that are you know crucified by empire. And the risen Jesus still had those moments mm -hmm. you know, of empire. Mm -hmm. How do you imagine crucifixion? Like if Jesus just got sent, then you can imagine um, the Jesus narrative as apolitical, if it was just predestined right. to death or anything. Yeah. Um, but if you imagine one as the action of empire and one as the response to death, right. um, it's, just, it's a totally different yeah. way to engage that. Because I can say that the power of the, the resurrection of the, you know, it's like, uh, it's just a 
And there is something that I think is, um, as fleshy as it is, it's also like a cosmic, that somehow we're, like, we're all connected. Yeah, the appearance story, the appearance of the risen Jesus are actually all call stories as well. In other words, there are stories about the beginning of the transformation of his followers and believers, mm -hmm. right? Who have experienced this trauma. I mean, races that have trauma. Mm -hmm. They've experienced this trauma, and it's, it's, it's about their beginning of transformation. It's the, I mean, the resurrection leaves you with the question, what are you going to do or what are you going to do? And so I want to talk a little bit about that, right? That, that, that the crucifixion resurrection, which is what Lent is leading us towards, Lent is leading us towards the cross. And that community is a big piece of that. Um, the community that, that, that goes on past Jesus' suffering and death. The community that that keeps his movement alive, and the community that we find in the reason why we come together as Christians, right? Um, so I think this is throughout the biblical narrative, right? From the very, very beginning, um, the you know there's there's two human beings in the garden, not just one, um, and throughout even Genesis. I called it here, this is one of our Bible studies, I called it a family of strangers because the communities that come together are based off of um, God's promise. And so it was never, God never promised it to one person. God's promises were for the community at large. So throughout all these stories that we have, um, Abraham being visited by the angels and um, then telling Sarah that she would be pregnant, um, even in, in her old age, that this was a promise made to both Abraham and Sarah that the community would grow and that God would, would be part of that community. Stories like the Pentecost are all about communities coming together, right? And that God's word and God's spirit came not just to one person, but to the community. And that community means something, especially in our culture that oftentimes, you know, really really props up and, 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 um, and imagines that it's only about our individual selves, go west, young man, uh, you know, take care of yourself, look out for number one. Um, and so in the words of Pope John Paul II, right, he said that autonomy was the greatest form of heresy. So even saying that it's heretical to think that we can only take, that we can take care of ourselves and we don't need anybody else. In the story of Jesus, we have these continual pieces of community. And community for both good and bad, right? That the community is a part of, of, of the whole experience of Jesus' uh, story, Jesus' life and death and resurrection. It was not done by himself. Right? So if we look at the if we look at Palm Sunday, which will be coming up in this season, um, the palms are being you know, Brian laid out by the community, by the people who are following him. And that same people who yell out Hosanna, who, who, who lay down the groundwork for Jesus, under the same ones who then are yelling crucify him. Right? So the community is, is both good and bad, right? That the community that Jesus is a part of um, even leads to his crucifixion, Right? And so there are moments like this story from Luke chapter 4, right, where Jesus gives his inaugural sermon, and he pisses the people off so much, right, that they take him up to the cliff to throw him off. So this community in this way, that even when Jesus is extending God's love beyond Israel, which is what these people are pissed off about, when he extends it to the entire world, to, to the whole community, to those on the margins, then this kind of response happens. Even when Jesus brings together the 5,000, we heard that in our opening thing. When, we, when Jesus brings together the 5,000, the 1,000 people and, and feeds them this amazing act of community, um, I love this, this is from the, uh, a, a Lutheran um, study little pamphlet on, on what, what does communion mean. So there's these great drawings, and you can even see some, some of the people there on the outskirts, right, saying things like, some of these people don't deserve free food. I'm upset, disgusting. So even there, when the community comes together, right, there's, 
when, when, we, when we do a place for everyone, we say that there's a place for everyone, well, then that community, once it grows, then there's problems that come from it. Um, one of my favorite people I follow on Twitter, um, in the aftermath of the Pulse Massacre in Orlando, when Jesus, when Jesus names this, um, the Twitter handle, but also um, when, when, when Jesus, this is, this is referring to Jeremiah, and when Jeremiah places Rachel within the context of community, when she loses her children, she is crying out in community. There are healings that happen in community. The woman grabbing hold of Jesus' cloak and, and being healed. Jesus has harsh words for community, right? He, he calls community to account, the temple tantrum, so-called. But even when Jesus, like I said before, when he goes out, when he goes out to pray by himself, he's always returning to community. This is a, a shot from uh, the Gospel according to St. Matthew, an Italian movie in the 60s. But even when Jesus, when Jesus is teaching and preaching, um, he is always surrounded by community. And so I, I agree with this sense of, you know, that, that we don't need a new definition for Christianity, we need a new demonstration of it. That there is this piece that we know that Christianity is about community, but we need a new demonstration of that community. And I would say that there is a lot of what we do in our online presence that does that, right? That we're doing community in a way that connects with a lot of people. Um, and so, of course, to quote the, uh, the uh, esteemed Baltimore author, Meredith Gould, right? What becomes possible when we recognize virtual community as real community? So I'm not saying that is it real community, but if we know and recognize that it is real community, what becomes possible? And things like our Lenten discipline this year, um, this is what becomes possible, that we connect people across the country, across the world, to follow along with the story, the story of salvation that, that walks us through the season of Lent. And we can see this stuff, right? I mean, I've shown some of this stuff before, but like, we can see the, the, the ways in which we connect with people. We can see that online. We have numbers for it. We can see that when somebody goes on and, and tweets out that this, this sense that she's been told about being born gay is not an automatic sin, that we can then connect with them, that we can be pastoral, that we can bring them into community. We have a lot of those pieces too, right, from our Slate Speak conversation on Thursday nights, and how people call it an actual community. They call it a church for them, right? This also includes people who say that when they come together for these, these things, that this is community for them. This is real. This is, this is actually affecting people. And so when we make those promises in baptism to live among God's faithful people, that's not a suggestion. It's a, you know, it's, it's, it's a promise that we make. It's a covenant that as we go through baptism and communion and ways in which we connect with others, we are bringing ourselves into community for better or for worse, that we're, we're intimately connected with, with that community. Now we'll um, shift a little bit as we, as we kind of bring our prayers together for communities both here and, and beyond us. Let us pray. Pray for our communities both here and face to face and online, ways in which people are touched, ways in which community gathers. We pray for all those hurting hurting in our communities, all those who are struggling.
pray for communities we've never met. Communities in Syria, in Israel and Palestine. Communities in the United States that are facing deportation, discrimination. For what else do the people of God pray? who feel alienated or excluded from the communities that they love and for those who are doing the excluding. For those who are ill, for those who are, who are in the hospital, those who are recovering and that or feel isolated from community, um, feel isolated from contact. For those with mental health issues that they might be able to find treatment and strength for the journey. Prayers for all those without good access to health care. For all those in D.C. protesting this very minute to fight for the rights of those that the government would oppress and for the families and all the people who are currently being oppressed. Bind us together in community, O oh God. Give us strength. Give us courage. Empower us to seek justice. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. Amen.